know your name, I know you great Yeah, 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 yeah. Control my life, so I put my trust in you. You control my life, I put my trust in you. I know your name, I know your grain. Bad vibes can't even come my way. I'm just tryna serve, Lord, bring that place. Back in the days, couldn't find my way, but I know you got me. I ain't no love like you and me. So I was blind, but now I see. Why got all this face on me? Uh, it's really easy to maybe pretend to one another that everything's fine and everything's okay, but I just wanted to encourage those of you who maybe feel like things are not on the right path or you're taking a lot more time with the Lord. Um, and the scripture that came to me was uh, Romans 8, verse 38 and 39. Uh, and it says, um, For I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the reason, the reason that came to mind, I think, was just to remind us that no matter what season you're in and where you're at in life and how things are going, whether it's work or uh, family, raising kids, whatever it is that you're going through, um, just remember that God is with you, he loves you, and nothing can separate you from his love. Um, as we start this service, I'll invite the worship team up uh, but I'm just going to open with prayer, um, and yeah, I just hope that we will have a, a lovely service. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, Lord. Thank you for um, fellowship. Thank you for family. Thank you for uh, our home that we have in you uh, and in this church. Father, I pray today specifically for our service, Lord. I pray for our worship uh, and our time in the Word and our time in learning about you. Lord, I pray that no matter who is up here or who has the mic, Lord, that it is less of us and more of you. Father, I pray for your peace and your spirit over this place and over each individual. And I pray that you would meet them where they are, Lord, no matter what is going on in their lives. Uh, I pray that you would speak to each and every one of your children here today and, and that we have a wonderful service. Despite the cold, I pray that you would warm us up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Our God is good, amen. We serve a mighty and strong God. He never fails us. He's everlasting. Hallelujah. The Bible says that, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Hallelujah. So even if we're feeling weak and tired, we have our strength in our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And you'll never fail us. So as we sing, let's just um, keep in mind that he is a strong God and he never just fails us. Hallelujah. Amen. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will 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 wait upon the Lord. 
worship team thank you so much god is good god is good um it is that time of the service where you get to chat to that'd be great cool so we have a lot of notices to get through so bear with me and we have a few different people coming up to speak and sharing some uh testimonies and stories so yeah we'll get through this and it'll be awesome uh the first thing is to keep denzel jemima and family in our prayers Um, and all of Eliane's family as well. Uh, They are preparing for a very private funeral. So unless you have been invited, you are not invited. Um, So please respect that. Um, And going on to that, Denzel will also uh, be off until Monday the 6th of November. So in that time, uh, please respect his privacy as he is uh, grieving and if you think that you need to message him for anything, please go through uh, the diaconate. That's what uh, we are here as a church to support him. So if you have anything to share, please go through them. Um, yeah, and just giving him that time to settle back into work slowly. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen in the news, on social media, uh, the news happening in the Middle East with Gaza and Israel. Um, we just want to keep the victims and the families, the people losing loved ones, losing their lives on both sides. We want to keep them in prayer. And just for us to be praying that God has his way in that place, it's, um, it's really difficult to see some of the uh, scenes that we're seeing on in the news and some of the stories that we're hearing. So yeah, in your private time, in your personal time, please do keep that situation in prayer. Um, we also have, so one of our members, uh, a member of the church, Malcolm, he usually sits around here. Uh, unfortunately, Malcolm has had a fall uh, this last week, and he is uh, recovering in St. George's Hospital. So if we can also keep him in prayer, um, that would be awesome. And hopefully we get to see him back here well and soon. 
And yep, so we have the elections for the new deacons. Um, so that will be held at the next church members uh, meeting on the 3rd of December. So that's the 3rd of December. Um, and yeah, this is important for the life of our church because we get to uh, vote for or, or nominate people that we think are going to be great in leading our church and supporting uh, Denzel and the team uh, in yeah. line with what the Bible says. Um, so nomination forms will be made available from next Sunday, so the 5th of November. Uh, and the deadline for completing those nomination forms is the following Sunday, the 12th of November. So next week, you're going to pick up nomination forms, and the following week, you're going to drop them off. That is the deadline. Uh, and they'll be returned to K. Yes. Sorry? There are two vacancies from my uh, understanding. So there's two nominations. Six nominations. Sorry, I thought there's two people that I know that are stepping down, but we are voting for six. Thank Six nominees. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and if you need to understand the role of a deacon uh, before making a nomination, please speak to any of the deacons. Uh, and if you have any questions about the nominations or the election process, please speak to Kay, who is at the back. Uh, moving on from the deacons' uh, nominations and elections, we also have baptism. So if you're interested in being baptized uh, with us at WCBC, uh, please speak to Kay or Dapo. Uh, and we will have new classes, new baptism classes, starting in the new year. Um, we have the Discovering Jesus ministry. Uh, and the door-to-door -door evangelism, which will be, which will return this week, uh, Wednesday and Friday, uh, respectively. So Wednesday we'll have discovering Jesus ministry, and then on Friday we will have the door-to-door -door evangelism. Uh, and if you can, if you are available, if you are able, please be encouraged to serve in these ministries where you can. Uh, we have the monthly church prayer on Friday uh, evening at 7:30. I think that's this. Friday, I believe so, uh, at 7.30 in the lounge. So we have this once, I think it's the first Friday of every month. So if you are able to, please do come and attend. Um, now I think we have some, so moving on to sisterhood. So sisterhood, we have uh, the next sisterhood meeting will be on uh, Saturday. So that's the 4th of November, Saturday the 4th of November. Uh, please read Esther's chapter 7 and 8. And even if you haven't read any of the uh, previous chapters or if you haven't been to any of the previous sessions, please do come. Like I, I do believe that the women are being empowered, encouraged, and they're learning about their faith and uh, deepening their uh, relationship with uh, God. Uh, what we have now is we have two testimonies. So I'll invite Nelda up first to share. Oh, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Morning, church. Um, I want to share with you why attending church on a regular basis is not only important, but aligns with the teachings and examples set by Jesus. First and foremost, I have personally experienced the value of gathering together in worship. When I attend church, I feel a sense of belonging and community. It is a space to connect with like-minded individuals who share my values and beliefs. In this busy and often isolating world, the church offers a support system that uplifts and encourages me through life's challenges. By regularly attending church, the sermons and teachings provide guidance, inspiration, and an opportunity for personal growth. I have learned so much from members of the church and their experiences have, de have deepened my understanding of faith. Through the church, I found a place of reflection, meditation, and worship, strengthening my relationship with God. Another reason attending church is important to me is the opportunity it provides for service and giving back. Through various volunteer opportunities, I have been able to make a positive impact on the lives of others. Whether it's um, being on the welcome team at the back of the church, um, counting the collection, or lending a helping hand to those in need. The church has allowed me to compassionate, to be compassionate and share my, belief, my blessings. Moreover, attending church has been a sanctuary for healing and restoration in my life. During times of grief, loss or personal struggles, the church has provided me with a safe space where I can find solace and comfort. 
The prayers, support, and love from various members of the church have brought me strength and hope in my most challenging moments. Finally, attending church regularly has helped me prioritize my faith and values. In the midst of our busy lives, it's easy to lose sight of what truly matters. And church gives me a designated time to pause, reflect, and realign my focus on my relationship with God and my spiritual journey. Attending church on a regular basis not only aligns with the teachings and examples set by Jesus, but it has also personally enriched my life. It has provided me with a sense of community, a space for spiritual growth, an opportunity to serve others, and a chance to prioritize my faith. It has also given me the tools and support I need to navigate through life's ups and downs with a strong foundation and a deeper sense of purpose. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And we have uh, Danielle also sharing as well. Give her a round of applause, please. Hello, church. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to share kind of my testimony about the sisterhood um, Bible study that I've been going to. Um, so I have attended all apart from one, unfortunately. Um, and I just wanted to speak to encourage, I guess, more women in the church to attend. Um, so I kind of put it down into three categories as to what I really love about it. Um, the first being the hosts, who are Liz and Jemima, who are not here today. Um, but I really value that you can tell that they put a lot of time into researching what they're um, sharing with the, well, class on those days. Um, you can tell that they know a lot about the Bible, and I really value that they share that with us. As well as you can tell that they really, so during these... Um, Bible studies like it can get really heated sometimes you know we have questions and debates and they allow everyone to have the time to share their point and get their point across and they also know when to, to bring it back in to get us back on track so that's one thing the second thing I put it down to is kind of how I guess it kind of leads into the first point but how interactive the session is so they ask questions to all of the members who attend they ask the right questions to ensure that we understand what we're reading, um, and then they allow us again to ask questions and to share our opinions. And then lastly, what I really value about it is its purpose, so its intent, which is at the end of the day, to glorify God. Um, as Christians, I think it's important that we know the Bible. It's a tool that God gave us. And so if we take a bit of time on a Saturday to learn a bit more, I think God God smiles on us. He values us that we took the extra time and we put the extra effort in to learning something new. Um, so, yeah, I encourage everyone to come. There's all ages. Like, the ages really range from young to not so young. <laughs> um, yeah, everyone shares their opinions. And it's really, it's really nice to be in a room full of, a room full of women who know the word. Um, and I remember in school there was a picture of like these pencils and there was a dull pencil in the middle and sharp pencils around it and the purpose of the picture was to surround yourself with people you want to be like. Um, and I can say that I am not that great in knowing my word as yet, I don't know the Bible that well. But to be in a room surrounded by women who know the word, they can think of verses just like that, they can think of stories just like that. It's really inspiring and it's what keeps me coming. So I want to be able to do that one day. So yeah, even if you've not read Esther, it's a really short book in the Bible, so you can catch up. And I'm sure that any woman who has come before, they, they'll be happy to share their notes with you. Um, I'm happy to share my notes with you also. So yeah, I just encourage everyone to attend the next one. And thank you. Awesome, thank you, Danielle. Okay, cool. Uh, moving on to the WCBC uh, Football Club. Uh, we have, um, well, the, the team will be playing an important league fixture on Saturday. So while the uh, ladies are at Sisterhood, some of the guys will be playing at Eltham Football Club at 1.30 if you are free. So if you're not at Sisterhood, so men, talking to you, don't be at Sisterhood. 
be at Elton Football Club at 1.30. Please do go and support the team. Uh, and if you can't go, keep them in your prayers. Uh, I'm hearing that they are... We're all in need of prayers, but... <laughs> I'm not singling any, anything out. But anyway, yes. Um, yeah, and just to remind us of all that, this is not about football. Uh, this is about spreading the gospel. The team come into contact with... The majority of the people that the team come into contact with are people that are new to the faith or are learning about Christ or, or don't hear about Jesus. And that is the important thing of why they're doing what they're doing. So please do pray for them. Uh, next, we have Anik and Fred, or just Anik. Yes, both of them. Yes, please. Uh, coming up to, to talk about your recent trip to Malawi. Awesome. Give them a round of applause, please, guys. Good morning, church. What a privilege. What an honor to be here this morning. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for what you are doing for tear dryers for the children in Malawi. And our trip, last trip, was awesome, magnificent. We met a lot of uh, great people. We had divine encounters. And for that, my wife is very good. I will allow her to really explain to you the details of what happened in Malawi. God bless you. Hi, good morning again. So before we play the video, I just want to lay and really give a very big round of applause to Frederick. Can we please help me celebrate him, yeah? Because you would understand that we had a few crises and he had to wake up several times at three o'clock in the morning to go and queue up so that we can get some fuel to do everything that we needed to do. So I was like, I was sleeping. <laughs> so just for that. And before I play the video, I would just like to um, just stress, we'll start with the video, but before the video... Just like to tell us a little bit about ourselves because I know you see us a lot and you don't know where we, we didn't fall from heaven and just landed here. Just to say that we have been married for 15 years. We've known each other for 17 years. Okay. So as single people, we were both missionaries. So I was a city missionary. I had my city. He was a city missionary as well. We did that for a couple of years before we got married. And I left my city and I went to join him. And we did that together for five years. So we were, let's say, and then together city missionary, all of that for like, 13, 14 years of that before we went to Malawi and for God leaders us in Malawi for two years and we stayed there for two years in an orphanage where we serve voluntary. We took a step of faith and moved there. So you just know a little bit about ourselves. So what you're seeing there is not, it's not a fruit, it's not something that happened overnight. It is many years of doing this thing in the city we were, that is in France, in Paris, and in the different cities that we were sent in France. So just to put that foundation there. Thank you. And now we are going to see the video. The video, what you will see in the video, we decided in the place where we work, that is in Bankwe, it is a township where you have the highest number of street children in Blantyre. So it is a very strategic city. And it's also a very strategic school because in that school there are 3,000 children and some of them have started going to the street. So we are, it's part of our prevention strategic because if we can get them to start working in literacy and numeracy, Perhaps we can see how we are then going to help them to do a vocational training instead of earning, instead of going to the streets. We took our time to go to the school several times and we were given all the results. That's how we selected. And I was shocked that in, in the classes like of five, six or standard five, six, seven, where they have like 110, 120 people and children, the pass rate was only 25%, in some 13%, which is quite worrying because if God doesn't help us to give a strategy, a lot of those children, we are going to meet them on the streets. So enjoy this video. That will be part one. Thank you. Amen. 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 If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Amen. If you're happy and you know it, can you say amen? Amen. If you're happy and you know it, can you say amen? Amen. If you're happy and you know it, can you say amen? Amen. If you're happy and you know it,
And a very big thank you to, um, to West Creedon Baptist Church because while we were standing in faith and I felt like God did say that we have to try and give and buy school materials and backpacks. We didn't get backpacks for everybody just because we didn't realize how, bad, how much it was expensive. Backpacks are expensive in Malawi. So we received, I was standing there and then someone just, uh, and I think, um, just came to me and said, oh yeah, we have to give you, I've forgotten her the name, I can't believe it. Joyce, yes. And she said that um, the church was um, gave us um, 1,000 pounds and an unknown individual who still remains, wants to remain unknown, gave us 1,000 pounds. So it was such a blessing to, um, to be able to have, to have that. So it's West Croydon Baptist Church were the main sponsor um, the majority sponsor of these, and you can clap for yourselves, yeah. Thank you. And I will finish with this short presentation. I will present you a bit, the team, and what we are doing next. Some of the children, the young adults that we are supporting, who are all orphans into their schools. And um, I will share that a little bit because people have asked me a lot of questions. And it, it's a, a, so I just thought I'll do it so that everybody just knows. So let's start it. We're going to start with our... Um, our main um, project coordinator, who is like our first son, is um, Chico. He's, uh, he's on full-time staff now since the month of March. He grew up as well in the orphanage that we served. He went through, he also graduated, which was what we celebrated as well as part of the graduation in community development. The second slide is um, Dranes. Dranes is also very fantastic. She's going to be coming full-time as well, and she will be our administrator and safeguarding coordinator. She will also oversee the ladies. I'm going to talk about it, the girls. And this <laughs> next one is William. William as well, we've been sponsoring him. He's doing a, a study in professional community and development, and um, he should be um, finishing, we don't know, around um, September last of next of next um, year. He's on a full sponsorship with us, so that means we cover everything. Okay, next one. Um, so we got Sevi as well. She's another bright kid. Um, one of the kids she is, we had to place her in another orphanage for now. And uh, we sponsor her studies, and she wants to study medicine, and I'm really encouraged her to go into medicine. So by God's grace, she'll be starting in September of next year by faith. Next one. Sheila is also another one that we had to take because these kids, if we didn't take them, they would have been on the street because they were told to leave from where they were before with a lovely heart. And she is going to be studying social work from September, and we're looking into trying to register her. Next one, I'm trying to go faster so that I'll go. We got Ellen as well, that she has finished like the GCSE level or whatever we're searching to find out where we can, you know, put her through to continue her studies. 
And I think that's about, that was it, I think. Oh, there's a specific place where we have our little office, yeah? We, each time we kept going there, I noticed around the corner there were a lot of prostitutes, more prostitutes than they've ever been. I was like, what is, going, what is happening here? So I, I kept saying, I was very irritated each time we passed there. And I remember one evening, the Holy Spirit just said, you are talking to these ladies now. So we stopped on the way, and the lady in the white was the one I started speaking to. I didn't even know what we are going to, I started speaking to, and I said, you know, like, wanting to find out why she's on the streets and everything. And um, ironically, they all go to church, yeah? They all told me they go to church, they attend church on a Sunday, which means that attending church on the Sunday doesn't mean you're saved, okay? So I led them to the prayer. By the time I was talking to the lady in the white, the other people came, the other ladies came, and then I led them all to the prayer of repentance because I'm like, you've been, oh, you know, your lifestyle, it's whatever the reasons, your lifestyle has been grieving the Holy Spirit. So I led them to the prayer of repentance. I gave them, I asked them how much they were earning, and we're coming towards the end, and um, they told us how much they were earning. I gave them the money. I sent them all home. Gave them an appointment the next day for them to come. And they now come. And now we are doing something with them where they, they're starting a little business. So that was just something that was not in our project. But God just made it happen. And that's something just to pray for. So thank you very much again. And the, the last slide is just a prayer point where you can help us pray for. Thank you so much. Pray for provision in all areas, for the salvation and discipleship of all these children and all these ladies. For God, um, we're looking for a home for um, the girl's house and also for continuous favor and wisdom. So thank you very much for all your support. May God richly, richly bless you. And the last slide, please, that was just to say a big Thank you from Frederick and myself and say we love you very much. Thank you both. Awesome. Uh, we are going to ask Lorraine to come up uh, in prep for the Bible reading. This reading is taken from Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 18. The apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Starting from the beginning, Peter told them the whole story. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds. Then I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, if we can invite Brother Dapper up and give him a round of applause as well. Please, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hope you're all well. It's half term week. So 
you kind of wonder whether it's the kids or the parents who have actually gone on holiday for half term. But it's good to see you all. Lorraine, thank you very much for the reading. And can I just say thank you to Scanta for your openness, honesty, and vulnerability right at the beginning of the service. May God honor you for your humility. And when I grow up, I want to be like you. <laughs> Once again, I'm grateful to the leadership for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. And I pray that um, the words I will speak will be that which will challenge you. I do have to give account for this. I am very, very conscious of that. So help me God. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you because we are alive and only the living can praise your name. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Thank you for the spare ribbon side. Thank you for the blood that flowed out of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of his cross. Thank you for his death, his burial, his resurrection. Thank you that we have been given life in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit among the apostles. We thank you, Father God, for all that your word is showing to us. And this day, as we continue our look into the scriptures, we pray that our lives will be illuminated by your word. There will be people who are edified by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So after a short pause, we continue today with our study of the book of Acts. Um, and we come to Acts chapter 11. Um, you will remember that the last piece that we looked at was Acts chapter 10, where we looked at Peter. We looked at the vision that he had. We looked at the man, the centurion Cornelius. And when the two came together and the message that was preached by Peter um, um, when, when he got to Cornelius' house. Um, you'll remember that um, Peter received a vision from heaven with sheep, the sheep that had all sorts of four-footed animals in them, and the voice from heaven came and said, rise, kill, and eat. The voice made that statement three times. Let me pause there for a minute and acknowledge um, a very, very um, honored brother in this place. After that service, when I spoke just about three minutes, three, three minutes, three weeks ago, um, he actually came to me and he pointed out something I had not realized from the scriptures about Peter. Um, so this brother came, um, uh, he, he said, do you realize that with Peter, it's always three times? So Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times. And after Jesus had resurrected and, G and they were walking along the coast, how many times did Peter, did Jesus say to Peter, do you love me? How many times was that? Three times. And in this case again, it was what? Three times. Rise, kill, and eat. So I started to think about that. And I just kind of wondered, what kind of man is Peter that he's got to be told something <laughs> three times? Um, I soon shut down that conversation in my head because I kind of realized I'm probably somebody that the Holy Spirit has told a hundred times to do something, right? But the, the key lesson from that is this, that when Christ is determined that you will do something for him, he will persevere with you. He will persevere with you. So I wanted to really just say thank you to that brother. Um, it's always very good. It's, people think that when you stand up here, you know everything. But please, please, please don't stop coming to me to teach me because I do love to learn. So we see that Peter was somebody actually who has certain stubborn traits that needed to be knocked over by repetition. And in a way, that was good for him because at the end of Peter's life, he himself was actually martyred. Um, he was actually killed for, uh, uh, for preaching the gospel. We also 
did go into Cornelius and the kind of man that the scripture said that he is or he was. And we saw the message that Peter set out to Cornelius that led to the salvation of his family. We reminded ourselves that what Peter preached was the fullness of the gospel of Christ and him crucified. He started off by telling Cornelius that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Even if, it, even if that is the only statement that you say to unbelievers, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. There is a difference between saying Jesus Christ is my Lord and Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. Right? Let our conversation be what? Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Because that's, what he, that, that's who he is. Peter then set out that Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit and with power. He preached about the life of Christ. He preached about the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He preached about the visible, witnessed resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he said clearly that it is only by his name, by believing in Jesus, that there is forgiveness of sins and there is salvation. Now, the one thing we must always understand is this. The preaching of the gospel in all its fullness will always evoke a reaction from people. It will always provoke a response from people. Now, the response is probably one of three. When the, when the gospel is preached in its fullness and its robustness, people will either accept it, right? And people will, or people will reject it. The simple fact is that even for those who reject it, their lives will never be the same again. Because they can never say that they've not heard the gospel. But there is a, there is a third group. And indeed, before I go to that third group, the, the Bible do, does tell us in, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, that the preaching of Christ is like an aroma. It's an aroma of life to those who believe, but also an aroma of death to those who are perishing. So you see those responses. Now, for this third group of responses, and that's what kind of leads us to the story today, um, the preaching of the gospel is one that provokes a, a reaction of challenge. And when we look at the story today, we begin to see what happened with Peter. So Peter, having spent time with Cornelius' family, he goes back to Jerusalem. He goes back to Jerusalem, and it appears that the people in Jerusalem had heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And particularly those who were amongst the circumcision. So these were people who generally believed that even though you believed in Jesus, you needed to be circumcised. They were absolutely furious that Peter had gone into the house of somebody who was not circumcised. He'd gone into the house of a Roman. And when you look at the words that are the manner in which they challenged Peter, some versions of the Bible say they contended with Peter. Some said they criticized him. They argued with him. They confronted him. They protested. And they found fault with Peter. So step back for a minute and think about that. How on earth can somebody find fault with people coming to know Jesus Christ? How on earth can somebody find fault or take issue with the fact that the gospel has been preached to a group of people and they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine it. Imagine David going out to the streets um, and uh, bringing, preaching the gospel and leading the most violent gang members to Christ and they feel the pews here, what's our response going to be? How are we going to take that? So David, how could you? How could you do that? And that's what happened 
in this case, where Peter genuinely went to preach the gospel and he is given grief by his own brothers. Peter was faced with a choice here in terms of how to respond. How would Peter respond to this contention? How would Peter respond to this challenge? How would re Peter respond to this confrontation? Would Peter draw out his sword like he did when he cut off the ear of the high priest when they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Or would Peter deny Jesus again and say, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it? Would Peter say he made a mistake preaching to Cornelius? Or would Peter want to call down fire from heaven like some of the disciples wanted to do when Jesus was about to go through a town in Samaria, as we see in Luke chapter 9, and as we know, certain groups of people want to do in these our days? Would he want to call down fire upon these <laughs> believers who were challenging him? Peter was faced with a choice. Those sort of contentions is the kind of stuff that over the decades, over the centuries, has caused division in the church and has resulted in numerous denominations being created in Christendom. Peter was faced with a choice. Peter chose the path of humility. Even though Peter was a de facto leader of the group, he chose the path of explanation. The Bible says in verse 4 that Peter explained it to them from the beginning. What Peter was doing by that simple act was looking to preserve the oneness of the body. Are you with me? Preserving what? The oneness of the body. Now let me spend a few minutes on this matter of oneness. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays for his disciples. I would encourage you actually over this coming week to pick up that verse, that chapter, John chapter 17, and read that, read the prayer of Jesus for his disciples. And you'll actually find that you and I are actually included in that prayer. About two or three times in that prayer, Jesus prays that his disciples would be what? One. Now, this is not about sameness. It's not about each one of us having the same hairdo or each one of us wearing, having the same, wearing the same clothes or talking alike or having a special handshake that identifies us as one. It's not about uniformity. It's not about, you know, looking the same. It's about having the focus of the Holy Spirit on the glorification of Christ in all that we do. It's about having a heart that is focused on the glorification of Christ that makes us one in every way. So we look at that prayer of John in John chapter 17, verse 11. Jesus prays and his desire is that his disciples are one just as he and the Father are one. He says the same thing in, John, in verse 21 of John chapter 17, where he talks about the fact that oneness is what will make the world know that God sent Jesus Christ into the world. Oneness. In Ephesians 4, 3, we read about keeping the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Oneness. Oneness. 
I want to leave that theme with you as you leave today about the oneness of the body of Christ. Because it is in the oneness of the body of Christ that Christ is glorified. It is in the oneness of the body of Christ that the work of evangelism, the work on the face of this earth is effective. Peter understood that the challenge of the Jewish believers presented a moment of danger and he needed to handle the situation in a manner in order not to damage the work of evangelism that was going on. So Peter explained. He expounded the matter. He explained step by step. Other versions say he explained in detail. He rehearsed the matter. And in, and in ad adopting that approach, I want to believe that Peter actually took an example from the life of Jesus Christ. Because we do see from Matthew chapter 9 that Jesus, what he did what? He ate with tax collectors. We see from John chapter 4 that he spoke with uh, the woman from Samaria at the well. Are you with me? Jesus did not let himself be constrained by societal boundaries. He did not. So when he ate with the tax collectors and he was challenged by the Pharisees, Jesus said that those who are well have no need for a physician but those who are sick. And Jesus says to them, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. That's what people need. For Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous. Even when Jesus went into the house of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, the tax collector, man, this guy, a Jew, made himself rich of the labor of other Jews, and he was one of the, you know, the prostitutes and tax collectors were kind of the lowest of the low in society in those days. But Jesus calls Zacchaeus down from the tree, and he says, today, I'm going to sleep in your house. I'm going to lodge in your house. And Jesus says to him, today, salvation has come to this man's house because he's also a son of Abraham. So Jesus gave, through his life, an example of how to break down barriers in order to preach the gospel. Jesus also gave us an example of how to explain our actions in furtherance of the gospel. Jesus gave each one of us an example of how to live ready to preach the gospel. So here's my first question for each one of us and my first plea. Are we people that live ready to proclaim the gospel? Are we people that live ready to give an explanation to people when challenged of what we believe and who we believe? Are we people that approach contention with the aim of protecting oneness? Are we people that have a heart for oneness? And so my first plea to us today is that we should live ready to proclaim the gospel wherever we are, in the workplace, at home, recreational times, let's live ready to proclaim the gospel. Let's live ready to give an explanation of what, what we believe in Christ. Let's live ready to always protect the oneness of the body. So we see how 
Peter explain the situation. And then from verses 5 to 16, Peter now goes on to narrate exactly what happened when he was um, in Joppa and the vision that he had. When you study Peter's account in chapter 11 and compare it with the account in chapter 10, it's pretty much identical. There are a few differences. And the differences are actually in matters of detail. So for instance, in verse five, uh, Peter actually then takes personal responsibility. He says, this sheet that had all the animals, he, Peter says, it came to me, right? So it wasn't just a general vision for him anymore because of what he had experienced in the house of Cornelius. He now took personal responsibility for what he had seen. But I think by far the most important difference between what happened, what Peter narrated in verse 11 and what he narrated in verse 15, in, in, sorry, in chapter 10, is seen in verse 15, where Peter says, as I began to speak, this was when he began to speak to the house of Cornelius, the Holy Spirit fell upon us as, sorry, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Now let's understand exactly what Peter is saying here. When Peter says the Holy Spirit fell upon Cornelius and his family as upon us at the beginning, Peter is actually recognizing that Cornelius and his household are having their own Pentecost. Are you with me? He says, as upon us at the beginning. Peter is recognizing that Cornelius and his family are what? They're having their own Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit did not stop on Pentecost Day. Throughout the Acts of Apostles and throughout the centuries, the Holy Spirit, God has, has continued to pour out his Holy Spirit just as he said he would in the book of Job. So Peter recognizes that Cornelius and his family are experiencing their own Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit God's Holy Spirit into a man. And when God pours out his Holy Spirit into a man, into a woman, he does three things. One, it creates intimacy. God is saying, you are mine. You belong to me. Are you with me? Intimacy. When God pours out his Holy Spirit into a man, to a woman, provides what? Identity. You are part of my household now. You are part of God's household. There's intimacy. There's identity. And the third thing is inheritance. Peter now began to realize that to the extent the Holy Spirit had been poured upon Cornelius and his family, he now had to accept, he now had to believe that Cornelius and all the Gentiles have the same inheritance. The same inheritance that the apostles did. Where Cornelius came from became irrelevant. Cornelius' background became what? Irrelevant. What mattered now was that he had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's as if Peter himself 
was experiencing a new salvation because he was seeing something afresh. He had a mindset before, and with the baptism of the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius, he saw something new. He saw something afresh. And so the point here, or one of the points here is this. No matter how long or how little we have been following Jesus, the Holy Spirit regularly needs to do a saving work in our lives in order to renew our minds. In Peter's case, it was getting rid of a mindset. And when we look at our lives, my goodness, when we look at what has been built up over the years before coming to Christ, we'll see that that needs knocking away in order for the Holy Spirit to have his way in us. So Peter needed that experience with Cornelius. He needed that experience that the Holy Spirit gave him in order to open his eyes to see what needed to happen. Let's go to verses 17 and 18. And I'll read this out before we delve into it. And so after giving his story, Peter begins to conclude his explanation. And Peter says, If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. So having given his explanation, Peter recognizes that God is no respecter of persons. Jew, Greek, Scythian, whoever you are, salvation, the death of Christ is for all. The same gift of the Holy Spirit that he gave to the Jews, God also gives to the Gentiles. The same spirit that provides a necessary platform for oneness for those who believe in Jesus Christ. Somewhere in the book of Colossians, the Bible talks about the fact that the death of Christ has broken down every dividing wall and he came to reconcile the two, the two into one. But let's spend a few minutes, please, in the back end of verse 17. My version here says, who was I that I could withstand God. Who was I that I could withstand God? And that was a statement that actually kind of um, challenged me. When I looked at other versions as to what it said, some said withstand, some said hinder God, some said forbid God, some said stand in God's way, some said interfere with God. Other versions even said oppose God. And my goodness, I started to think about it. That in reality, the fact that Peter needed this vision to change his heart suggested that unknown to him, Peter's attitude was one that actually opposed God. So when Peter, when the, um, when the sheet was brought down from heaven, he was told, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, not so, Lord, not so, for I have never eaten anything common or uncommon. My goodness. That was Peter opposing God. That was Peter withstanding God. That was Peter interfering with God's plans. Yet, this was Peter who had preached to 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost. Yet, this was Peter who had said to the lame man at Gate Beautiful, and he said what? Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And yet we have Peter here, still in a position where he is withstanding God. 
And so I have to ask myself a question. In what way do I withstand God? In what way do I oppose God? And I throw that question to each one of us in this room today. In what way, in which way do I interfere with God's plan? You may ask the question, well, how will I know if I'm withstanding God, if I'm opposing God? Well, let's look at the scriptures and try and isolate a few items. A person withstands God when they reject the gospel. Yes? Yeah? When we think of ourselves better, more superior, holier than any other person, we withstand God. Because that's what Peter did. That's what Peter was doing. And that's why he said he could not withstand God, having seen all of that. When we think we are better than other people, when we think more highly of ourselves than we do others, we withstand God. When we think that the work we are doing in his vineyard is more important than the work that somebody else is doing in his vineyard, we oppose God. When we think that another person is not deserving of hearing the gospel, we oppose God. When we act in such a way as to damage or destroy the oneness of the body of Christ, we withstand God. When we profess to be Christians, but we are content to indulge in deliberate sin, we oppose God. And so my second plea to all of us in this room today, please never, let us never put ourselves in a position where we withstand God. Let us never put ourselves in a position where we oppose God. Because nobody can oppose God and win. It's not possible. It's just not possible. It is futile. It is futile. We then get to verse 18. And the Bible here says, when they heard these things, they became silent. They became what? Silent. When you look at Peter's explanation, he focused on the words and the action of the Holy Spirit. Nobody can raise any argument to refute the gospel. Nobody can raise any argument to refute the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so when these brothers heard Peter's testimony of what the Holy Spirit had done, 
they had no response. And I think the learning for us from that particular place, place, piece is that when we have to give account, just like Peter had to hear, let's not focus on ourselves. Yeah? <laughs> let's actually focus on what the Holy Spirit has done. Yeah? Because against that, there is no argument. There is no argument. Peter's response was not based on emotion, but on what Jesus Christ had done through the power of the Holy Spirit. They became silent. It's almost as if that's a, that was a victory moment. And the Bible then goes on to say that they glorified God. I pray that when we have to give an explanation for our actions in furthering the gospel, the response of people will be to glorify God. Whether it's what we do to uh, uh, a people of our, 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 of, our, of, our, of our demographic or any other demographic, that it will be a response that glorifies God. They became silent because there was no argument against the gospel. Peter's response was actually based on his own personal testimony of his experience, his vision he had, his obedience, and his submission to the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so the lesson I took from there is this. Never be ashamed to share your testimony. I was with, um, sometime, probably about six weeks ago, I was up, I was up in Southport, and I, I, I had a good conversation with a lawyer that works with Christian concern. And he said something to me. He said, if you want to know more about what we do, send me an email. If you ever get arrested on the street for sharing the gospel, give me a call. And he gave me his card. But he said one thing. He said, you can never be arrested for sharing your testimony. A lot of people don't know that. Well, you can never be arrested for sharing your testimony. Because under the Public Order Act, I think you're only arrestable if you cause alarm, harassment, or distress. But you can never be arrested for sharing your testimony. And that's what this lawyer said to me. Well, if you're arrested, you'll be wrongly arrested. I think that's the point he was trying to say. So let's learn to get our testimony into a, a compact manner that impacts. And let it be about what the Holy Spirit has done in us. They fell silent because there was no argument against the gospel. The Bible says they glorified God because that's what the gospel does. And they recognized that God had granted unto the Gentiles repentance unto life because Christ died for all. Let me bring all this to an end. Peter was confronted by fellow believers on account of preaching the gospel. He was account, he was, he was, he was, confronted simply because of societal norms that had been hardwired into their minds. Let's be people who focus on the word of God to enable the renewing of our minds so that we do not construct barriers that prevent us from sharing the gospel with other people. Peter had a choice to make in terms of how he responded. He chose the path of humility. He chose the path of accountability. He chose the path of detailed explanation in order to preserve the oneness, to preserve the bond of peace. Let's be careful about the choices we make when we're confronted, when we're challenged. Because Peter, through his choice, provided a good example 
of living ready to proclaim the gospel. Let me share an interesting point about Peter. After this very episode where he had this vision, where he went to the house of Cornelius, after this episode in chapter 11 of the book of Acts, do you realize, or maybe you will realize, that comparatively little is actually spoken of Peter in the rest of the book of Apostles, of the Acts of Apostles. There's a mention, I think, in the next chapter where he was in prison with, um, and the angel came to release him. But beyond this point, it's as if the Holy Spirit decides that the focus will shift from Peter to Paul. Because beyond this point, comparatively little, I didn't say nothing, but comparatively little is written of Peter in the remainder of the book of Acts. And this was about seven, eight years after Jesus' ascension. And the book of Acts spans up to about 30 years the imprisonment of Paul after the ascension. And it got me thinking why that was. It got me wondering why that was. Did Jesus, because of this experience, because of the fact that Jesus had to come with a fresh vision to Peter, Was Jesus of the view that Paul was now a more reliable vessel to carry the gospel to the Gentiles? I don't know. I was just asking myself some questions. Don't get me wrong, please. Peter continued his apostolic ministry to the Jews in Jerusalem. And we see that even from the epistles that he wrote. First Peter, Second Peter. Please don't get me wrong. But when it comes to the Gentiles... It's as if the Holy Spirit shifts their focus, his focus, from Peter to Paul. And I started to ask myself some questions. Did Peter disappoint Christ? After all that Peter had seen, Peter walked on water. Have you? Have you? Peter saw thousands being fed from five loaves and two fish. Peter had the revelation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter saw him hanging on the cross. Days after he was hanging from the cross, Peter saw him risen with the nail marks in his hands. Why did Peter still need this revelation or this vision to be convinced of what he should do? And therein comes my last plea. That may we be, may we never be people who disappoint God. May we never be people who fail God. Because if we disappoint God, God will not be disappointed. He will find a replacement. If we fail God, God will not fail. He will find somebody else. 
and that which should have been ours to experience with Christ, with God, we will miss out on it. There's a work to be done on the face of the earth for the furtherance of the gospel. And that work starts in our homes. It starts in our matrimony. It starts with our children. It starts in this community of believers from which we can take the message and the gospel to the world. Let's not disappoint God. Let us pray. As you bow down and bow your hearts, we've looked at the story of Peter and his interaction with Cornelius. We've looked at how Jesus had to engage with Peter in order to change his heart, change his mind. What does, what does Jesus need to change in your life? What does Jesus need to change in your life? We've looked at Cornelius. We've looked at the kind of person that he was. We looked at the influence that he had around him. It was his household. Who are the Corneliuses in your space? How do you and I respond when we're asked to give an account of our actions? Have you found yourself withstanding God, opposing God? So as you spend a few seconds praying, just want you to cry out to God. And if I can offer a prayer, let the prayer be this. Lord, help me not to fail you. Lord, help me not to fail you. And so, Father, we thank you very much for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Peter, this man upon which you invested so much. Thank you, Father God, for your Holy Spirit and the work that your Holy Spirit has done in the lives of believers and is doing in the lives of believers. And we appeal to your throne, O Lord, that we will be people who live ready to give an explanation for the furtherance of the gospel, who live ready to proclaim the gospel. Help us, Lord, to be men and women who do not withstand you, but who are always in obedience to you, to the direction of your spirit. Help us not to disappoint you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Um, what a great word. Thank you so much, Dapper, for always leading us uh, faithfully, diligently. Uh, honor you back for your teaching and your service to our church and to all of us. Um, yeah, wow. How do we disappoint God? Uh, there's a lot to think about and pray on. Uh, the team are going to lead us in um, worship, and at that same time, we're going to take our, our offering as well. So if we can just please stand and join the team. Amen.
to the end of our service. Are there any new people, new visitors? If you're visiting for the first time, um, can you raise your hand? We have a little gift for you that we would, one of our team would love to pass to you. Yeah, keep your hand raised. Welcome. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. Any, anyone else? Any other new visitors? Oh, yes. Welcome, sister. Thank you. We have one more at the front. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, That brings us to the end. So I'm just going to close in prayer. Before I do, I want to say thank you to the worship team for leading us today. Uh, Thank you to the AV team. Thank you to the host team, our kids team, and all who serve unseen as well. Uh, There's a lot that happens to make, there's a lot that goes into making church happen every Sunday. So thank you to all. Um, Yeah, if we could just bow our heads in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful day, Lord. Thank you for your teaching and your spirit. Uh, Thank you, Lord, that you have gifted us with salvation, that you've gifted us um, with um, a deep knowledge of you. And Lord, as we continue to uh, grow in our faith and as we continue to walk that out in our day-to-day lives, I pray that you be with each and every one of us as we go into this week, Lord, whether it be school, university, work, family, whatever it is that we have on our plates, Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to count on you, to uh, look to you, to Uh, rely on you, Lord. We know that we can't do anything in this life without your strength and without your grace, and we thank you for your mercies every day. Uh, Lord, I pray for uh, the people who weren't able to make it to our church today, our members, our pastor. Uh, Lord, we pray for everyone who's going through conflict in in the Middle East. Lord, we pray for uh, deliverance, and we pray, Lord, that your will be done in each and every situation that we face, in each and every situation that that the world is going through. Um, We pray for peace and and a blessed week ahead. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. And we quickly share the grace as well. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful week. There's tea and coffee uh, and refreshments, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you, Lord. Which one are we doing? Lord, bless you. face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give
be gracious to you.